Let us pray. O God, who in this wonderful sacrament have left us the memorial of your passion, grant us, we pray, so to revere the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may always experience in ourselves the fruits of your redemption, who live and reign with God the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and forever. forever. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made, who made heaven, heaven and earth. And may Almighty God bless you and remain with you always, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Well, this evening we bring to conclusion this year's uh, series of Lectio Divina, uh, and we are two-thirds of the way through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, so it's good to reflect upon that. The next year we will complete the Gospel of Mark, and it will, this, this evening we'll be uh, dealing with a passage relating to Palm Sunday and the cleansing of the temple. So it's a reminder to us that a third of pretty well each Gospel, and certainly the Gospel of Mark, is made up of Holy Week. We spend a third of the gospel on one week and a few days after, and the other two thirds is for everything else. And so it's a reminder to us of the importance, uh, not only of the teachings of the Lord, which we mainly get actually in the gospel of Matthew, the actions in the gospel of Mark, but it's also important for us to uh, remember uh, that the suffering, death, and resurrection of the Lord is the greatest reality of the gospel. It is the good news. And uh, the commentary, the uh, teachings, the things that lead up to it are given great importance to us, not only because they are true, but because they led into the act of salvation, which we celebrate each year in Holy Week, and which is found in, in the greatest portion of each of the Gospels. This passage we'll be meditating upon will be uh, chapter 11, verses 1 to 25. Uh, and it is the beginning of the Holy Week. It is the Palm Sunday, which is a bit odd since we're uh, in ordinary time and we have left Holy Week long behind, but we are following the sequence of the gospel. It's interesting to watch what happens here. We see the entry of the Lord into the Holy City. It is much more subdued than in the Gospel of Matthew. It's, it's much uh, quieter and uh, much more simple. Uh, and of course call, calls to mind the prophecies from Zechariah and the Old Testament about the coming of the messianic king into his city. It was a very unusual prophetic action. The prophets would very often not only teach by their words, but they would teach by some ceremony or some action which would communicate what, what they, the message they tried to get across. And we see one of those in the reading today as well, and that is the cursing of the fig tree. Uh, and we'll reflect a bit upon that and how in our own lives, uh, whether we are bearing fruit uh, in, as servants of our Lord Jesus. And then of course, there is the cleansing of the temple. St. John puts it early on in the ministry of our Lord. St. Mark uh, points, it out that it points out that it's later, which is probably historically more where it would have uh, occurred. And it was one of the things that led to the, the high priests and the officials of the, of the religion uh, turning against our Lord. So there's the passage we have. And we see just at this point, we'll have next time we have Lecture Divina in September, uh, in I hope a more beautiful setting than this, uh, we will be, uh, we'll be moving into the conflict with the people who could not listen to the word and who indeed were like the fig tree that had shriveled up, that did not have life within it, that did not give fruit and give life. But one thing, of course, we're going to have this evening is the entry into Jerusalem. 
Palm Sunday. And I cannot let pass an opportunity to read one of the marvelous poems of G.K. Chesterton, which you might say is a kind of a literary and poetic and beautiful parallel to the passage from the Gospel of Mark, which we will have for Lectio Divina this evening. And it's called The Donkey. When fishes flew and forests walked and figs grew upon thorn, some moment when the moon was blood, then surely I was born, with monstrous head and sickening cry and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody of all four-footed things. The tattered outlaw of the earth of ancient crooked will, starve, scourge, deride me, I am dumb, I keep my secret still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one far fierce hour and sweet. There was a shout about my ears and palms before my feet. So now let us begin our time of Lectio Divina. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. Enkindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us let go of all those worries and cares that so weigh us down, that fill up our hearts and minds and make us so self-absorbed, so deaf, so blind to other people, so deaf, so blind to the voice of God as he speaks to us in our life in this world and in the words of sacred scripture. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Let us ask the Lord to forgive those things within our hearts, those sins that weigh us down, that block the pathway to our hearts so that the Lord may not enter in. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. May we learn what this passage of sacred scripture says to our head, to our heart, and to our hands. To our head, to know the Lord. To our hearts, to love the Lord to our hands to serve the Lord. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. It will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door out in the open street, and they untied it. And those who stood there said to them, Why, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told him what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it, and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry 
And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and sought a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Let's reflect on this whole passage and ask the Lord to help us to see what does it say to my head, my heart, and my hands? This passage of the entry into Jerusalem, the shriveled up fig tree, the contention with the high priests and the officials, and the response that is asked of us. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it. It will send it back here immediately. As they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples. He entrusts to them the mission to prepare the way of the Lord as he entrusts to us the mission. He need not have done that. He can do everything. He is Almighty God. And yet he asks them to help set it up, to arrange his passage into the, have the great city, the city of Jerusalem, the holy city. He does this for us all the time, too. He calls upon us, each one of us, in different ways to prepare the way of the Lord. Maybe simple little ways, like arranging for the colt he's going to ride on. That's a simple service that they give to him. And yet he entrusts it to them. In that way, they help him. They prepare. They serve him. In our own life, in our own time, we're called to do that, too, in different ways each one of us in our own way, to go ahead of the Lord, to follow his will, to do humble service, to prepare his way that he may enter not only into the great city of Jerusalem, but may enter into this world. And they go immediately and do it. Immediately is the great word with Mark. Always, everything's immediately. There's that urgency. How often when we are given the mission that we have received, whatever it may be, do we dawdle about on the way and to simply take our time and not follow whatever the Lord calls us to do? And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, said to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it, 
and we'll send it back here immediately. How have I fulfilled the mission the Lord has given to me? Whatever it may be, each one of us, whatever it may be. Do I go before the Lord as these two disciples sent out? The word apostle means that, sent out to prepare the way to do his will. May I ask the Lord's forgiveness when I fail to do that. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it. And we'll send it back here immediately. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Well, there's going to be that. They would wonder, why are you taking that colt? Why are you doing it? And here's the only time in the Gospel of Mark that he uses the word, the Lord. A bit of the flash of the glory shines through here. It is the Lord. As in the Gospel of John, we hear, you know, it is the Lord. But here, Mark usually is much more low-key, much more quiet, and we see more of the humanity of Christ, except, of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration. But here, too, we see a hint of that as he begins his journey towards the suffering, death, and resurrection. The Lord has need of it, and we'll send it back here immediately. The Lord has need of it in our own lives. The Lord has need of it. Why should I follow his will? Because the Lord has need of it. That I do what I do, whatever it may be. We think of John Henry Newman in that great statement he has, a little section which I don't have memorized, I wish I did. You know, each one of us has our own special destiny, our own special mission in life, great or small, as the angels have theirs. We are called to fulfill whatever it may be. And we are doing it because whatever our mission may be, whether it's untying donkeys or something else, being on Vatican commissions and stuff like that, the Lord has need of it. So immediately. You know, snap to it. Let's just get on with the job. Do it. You know, we can't, you know, sometimes our faith gets very hoity-toity and kind of fancy. And there's something wrong when that happens. We just got to do it. You know, serve the Lord. Wash dirty feet. Do our job. Wash dishes. You know, I think I, I, I've told you many times that thing about, I don't know whether it's real or not true, but I, I think it is. And I read it somewhere about, uh, you know, when uh, Teresa of Avila was, you know, she's lifting off and all that, and somebody wanted to be a mystical nun like her, and she said, well, first let's do the dishes. First let's do the dishes. I remember that was my bishop, Bishop Redding, when I was a deacon, right? He, was, he trained me in a lot of things. He gave me a stack of houses, addresses, go visit them. He said, get out, knock on doors. But he also, he, did, he said, here, you take the towel, I'll wash you dry. And we just took care of the, the dishes. Uh, this is it. The Lord has need of it. So their mission was not to save the world, not to cause what it was to get a, get a donkey. <laughs> eh, it's a noble thing. So let's just ask the Lord to help us and think in our own life, where does the Lord have need? What is my mission? You know, what specifically right now in the next week? Let's not think of infinity. In the next few days, where should I say the Lord has need of it in something he's calling me to do in each one of us in our particular life? And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and we'll send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door out in the open street, and they untied it. And those who stood there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. Just follow his orders. Just like Our, our Lady you know, says at the wedding feast of Cana, do what he tells you. Do what he tells you. And so often, you know, we can kind of get all caught up in Oh, all kinds of complicated things, even in the church, maybe especially in the church, about this or that and how we're going to 
do things better and you know, all the different worries and cares we have, just do what he tells us. Do we lack faith in, in his providence? Sometimes I think we do. At least I sometimes think I do, I'm afraid I do. I'm so busy, busy about making sure things work out right. I get worried about things outside in the world or in the church even. You know, some days we get a lot of things get, we get a lot of things to get worried about. You know, oh, what's gonna happen? But I remember just, just recently hearing somebody say, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail. Yes, of course. It's just like I remember when I was doing my dissertation when I was years ago when I was a student in Rome and I was doing all kinds of things and one of the sisters of the place said, I was doing it on the apocalypse, so St. John, you know, and she said, well, I'll pray to St. John to help you. I'm ashamed to say I never thought of doing that. Isn't that true? So let's just, the Lord has need of it and the Lord will provide. The providence of God, one thing we know for sure, is the providence of God rises before the dawn. And the church is more like a rubber ball than a piece of crystal. And it's not ours anyway. We just borrow it, take it briefly. And the Lord is the master. We are stewards. We're stewards. We're entrusted with our life. We're entrusted with our mission in the church, whatever it may be, or our mission in this world for a brief time. And life is short for each one of us. And the Lord has need of us to do whatever we're doing. He's giving us a mission and then it's over but it's not ours, it's just entrusted to us. So we should trust the one who entrusts us. We should trust the Lord as much as he trusts us, if possibly we can. And then we won't be so caught up in worry. I remember seeing the famous mugs and coffee cups that said, keep calm and carry on. Somebody gave me one just a short time to keep stressed and then give up. No, 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 that's not, the, that's not the way to go. I think our hearts should be at peace because the Lord is guiding us. And they brought the coal to Jesus and threw their garments on it and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments on the road and others spread leafy branches which they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed cried, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. And here we have the entry into Jerusalem. He enters in with his disciples around him, before him, behind him, in the community of faith, which is what he has created around him. He doesn't walk alone into Jerusalem. He doesn't come like a warrior on a horse. He is on his donkey just coming along, surrounded by people. People he loves, people he sends on a mission, people who are there, one of whom will betray him, another one of whom will deny him, and most of them will run away eventually when people are not saying, Hosanna in the highest, but crucify him. And then they disappear like the first snow, gone. This passage should make us think. We should in fact, praise the Lord, sing his praises, Hosanna in the highest. That gets us in touch with the fact he is the Lord coming into his city. It is the Lord. But that has to go beyond our words of our lips or even of our hearts. It must be in our hands and our lives. There's a wonderful Psalm, Psalm 95, that anyone who prays the divine office prays at the very beginning of every day. It starts off with Hosanna type songs. Come ring out our joy to the Lord. Hail the rock who saves us. Let us come before him giving thanks with songs. Let us hail the Lord. A mighty God is the Lord, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his. To him belongs the sea for he made it and the dry land shaped by his hands. Come in, let us bow down and worship before the Lord who made us. It's filled with this entry into Jerusalem fervor. And we gotta have that. You know, we shouldn't dip our toe in the pool, we should dive in. The enthusiasm that comes from the fact that the Lord is in their midst, just as when the sea is bouncing the boat around, they should be at peace because Christ is in the boat. That's what gives us joy and gives us peace. 
And so it is appropriate to live life extravagantly. A kind of measuring out our faith in teaspoons is just not, doesn't cut it, really. But the other part, that's the Palm Sunday part. But when the guns begin to shoot, you know, they say when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Well, sometimes the tough run away, which is what the apostles did. But there comes a point then when the second part of the psalm applies, because the priests and people who pray the office start with that enthusiasm. Live your life with some of that. But then, however, oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts, as at Meribah, as on that day at Massa in the desert, when your fathers put me to the test, when they tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was weary of those people, and I said, their hearts are astray. These people do not know my ways. Then I took an oath to my anger. Never shall they enter my rest. We cannot be like at Meribah and Massa when Moses, you know, he said, strike the rock. So he's whacking away at the rock to make it happen. Not realizing God would provide the water from the rock. He's not going to do it. He's disobedience. We have to obey the will of the Lord. Do what he tells you. Obey his will and celebrate Hosanna and obedience. The two of them really go together and they should be there in our faith. So let's just rejoice and think of that. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. May I have enthusiasm? Not based upon pumped up psychology or whatever, but upon the fact that Jesus is Lord. The Lord of my life, the Lord of the world, to you, O Lord. From that comes, from that doctrinal clarity of the reality of the presence of Christ, which we think about especially today on the feast of the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ. My Lord and my God, this gives us the fire, the energy. But it can't just be Hosanna, Hosanna. It's got to be do what he tells you. Go and get the donkey. He needs it. That's the kind of nitty gritty, low grade obedience which wins our way, not just into Jerusalem, but it'll bring us by God's grace through the pearly gates. And as he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Now that's kind of interesting. <laughs> Here we have this grand entrance sweeping into Jerusalem. Hosanna in the highest. As soon as he gets there, he enters Jerusalem, goes into the temple, takes a quick look around. I think I'm going to head for home, he says. They all go back to Bethany. The entry had a point, but it's very low key. He doesn't at that point yet begin to enact and show and manifest his glory. He has made his point, and now he gets back together with the 12. Because it is not in grand gestures that we are saved. It is not in that, that must be done, prophetic actions, and he'll do another one before this is over. But he needs to be there with the 12, knowing that one of them would betray him and one of them would deny him and the others would run away. But he needed to be with them. And that quiet presence, that ministry of presence, is at least as profoundly important as the majestic Hosanna in the highest and entry into the holy city. They're both there, and they're particularly there in the Gospel of Mark. Mark is very much up close and personal with Jesus. The majesty we see more clearly often in the Gospel of John is not so much evident in the Gospel of Mark, although it flashes through. And so which is a more accurate portrayal of the Lord Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John? And the answer is yes. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, 
May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, being a person of the land, and they were only in April, he knew that the figs didn't come until June. So he wasn't mistaken. This is a prophetic action. He comes to his people, lots of leaves, lots of leaves there. Not leaves, that's the hockey team, leaves, leaves. I always, my theory is the maple leaves would do better if they got the grammar right and became maple leaves, leaves, not leaves. But anyway, he found leaves upon it, lots of green leaves, but no fruit. Too many leaves, not enough fruit. And so he cursed that. He said, that's not enough. No, no to that. Now, the fact, the detail that it wasn't time for the fruit yet is, is there, but the point is, too many leaves, not enough fruit. We gotta look at that. We gotta look in the mirror. Would the Lord say about you and me, too many leaves, not enough fruit? Do we have anything that will feed the hungry people? Feed our own heart? Do we have fruit to offer to God and to the people? Or are we just leaves, leaves, lots of leaves, but no fruit? I think we gotta think about that. And I think that's probably the point. Our Lord was obviously, I mean, not trying to figure out why do I not get figs when it's not time for figs. I think his point is just to make that point. I don't know, I think that's the meaning of the prophetic action. That we can't be satisfied with lots of flashy leaves, including the beautiful temple and the beautiful things, all these things, it's gotta bear fruit or the rest of it is just not enough. It's just like the image of the comet. It's always something I think is important. The comet is going across the sky. It's that nugget in the front that makes it happen. The big flashy tail is beautiful, but it wouldn't be there if it weren't for that. And the Hosanna is great, but there's gotta be the obedience and the action. There gotta be fruit. That's like in Psalm 95. Beautiful beginning, come ring out our joy to the Lord. That's the way to start the day. The glory, the joy, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes, the name of the Lord. But you gotta have fruit. <laughs> something gotta be there, something nourishing has gotta be there. So that's true of a lot of things. Um, it's like Pope Francis said in his big chunk in the section of his joy of the gospel about preaching that feed the people. Let there be fruit, not just leaves. So let's think about that. Where in my life, each one of us, would the Lord say to me, too many leaves, not enough fruit. And how can I ask the Lord to help me bear more fruit and maybe either just cut off the leaves or not concentrate on them? The frothy stuff, the external stuff. And they came to Jerusalem. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. In the outer courts of the temple, because the, the people needed to change their Roman coins with pictures of the emperor for Jewish coinage that did not have a graven image on it, there were money changers. It's interesting, by the way. Remember when our Lord is, is asked, who, what about God or Caesar? He says, let me have a coin. Whose face? He didn't have one of the Roman coins on him. He had to get one of the Pharisees to provide him with a pagan coin. Uh, anyway, whose face is this and whose image? So there are these money changers there to so the people, in a sense, if they were honest, that's fine. I think they were a den of robbers, he says, so they were also cheating the people. But they were making the whole thing 
Too many leaves, too much. This stuff that there's no life in it. And they were, were doing that. And it's just not right. So he purified the temple of the Lord. I remember reading the, one of my great heroes, a St. Charles Borromeo. And in the great cathedral of Milan, apparently when he became bishop there, they were doing that. They were set up you know, in, this, in the church. They were having a passageway, quick way to cut across. We go right through the church. So they were using it as kind of a thoroughfare, carrying things back and forth and, and using it not for what it is. Boy, we have to think of that. The church has got to be what it is meant to be and serve God's people and do it right and not be caught up in our own private, whatever it is. Now, that's true, we can look at all kinds of things, but for the glory of God, the beauty must serve the Lord and his people and not be for ego, not be for individuals. We always are in trouble when we get too much caught up in that. So he taught and said, is it not written, my house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations. And it's for all the nations. The temple of the Lord is to be a place that welcomes people, where the glory of the Lord shines forth, where the beauty of God's presence is there as a, a port in a storm, as an oasis in a desert. It's there. It's a place to welcome everyone and to let people have an experience in the midst of this world of the peace that comes from the Lord. And that's true in our own lives in any way, in our own personal life, the life of our families, our parishes, our diocese, whatever, the universal church. It's, we gotta see the purpose of what we're doing and live it faithfully. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and sought a way to destroy him. For they feared him because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. The chief priests and the scribes heard it. All that he was doing, especially the scourging of the temple, the cleansing of the temple. And they were angry at that and they wanted to destroy him. He who was purifying the temple of the Lord, so that it might be a place where its beauty would lead people to the Lord and not to simple personal gain. And they sought to destroy him, but the people, they feared him because the multitude was astonished at his teaching. Just think of how often through the Gospel of Mark we hear of that. The people are astonished at his teaching. They're astonished at him. Are we astonished at the Lord? Or have we so lost our sense of the glory of the Lord that we have domesticated the Lord? We have made him part of the furniture, made our faith that. Remember G.K. Chesterton not only wrote the beautiful poem, but he said, the world is not lacking in wonders, it's lacking in wonder. So the chief priests are angry and the people are astonished and marveling at what this man says. It is not like the others. He speaks with authority and not like the scribes and the chief priests. Maybe we could think of that especially at any time. When we read the word of God. We take our time of prayer so that we can be astonished once more and get rid of that film of cynicism that comes from familiarity and our own pettiness and come to a sense of the Lord, wondrous in majesty, astonished at, let's be astonished at what he says and let it touch our hearts. To even see Christ and want to destroy him, not to be touched by his presence. How hard the heart is for that. And we can't just point at the Pharisees and the scribes. How often do we ourselves become automatic in our religion? 
lose that zeal and innocence. That's why it's so beautiful giving communion to little children and hearing the confessions of children. So beautiful, so profound to see the faith shine out. And that's why we have the feast, the solemnity of the body and blood of Christ. Jesus doesn't need monstrances and candles and incense and those other things, but we need them so that we do not miss the many splendored thing. We can break through that shell of cynicism and of dullness so that we can be astonished at Christ, and his message and his person, and not be so hardened that we ignore him or try to get rid of him, if not to destroy him. May we spend some time each day becoming astonished once more at the presence of the Lord. And as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe you have received it, and it will be yours. Peter always has an instinct for aiming low. He just points out, oh, it's withered. Yes. And the Lord was teaching in that prophetic sign. And he also teaches another lesson in this second part, where he speaks of that power of prayer. So much of this world is beyond our power to change it and shape it. So often we think we can, and that we are deluded. And so we need to be attentive to that. Say, Lord, that I may see, that I may see, that I may be your faithful servant. Whenever you stand praying, forgive. And if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Here we have a hint of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive. Have mercy. We're entering into the Jubilee of Mercy that our Holy Father, Pope Francis, has instituted. Forgive. That's more than flinging a mountain into the sea in some of our situations. That's more than making a fig tree wither. To have that ability to forgive in the midst of a world in which so much, you know, I think that can happen. People, when they face affliction or injustice, it's always going to hurt and it's always going to cause a reaction, maybe of anger, first of all, or of fear or other things. But there's got to be a way through it, through forgiveness. That's what our Holy Father was saying today and during his visit to a war-torn land where he listened to the horrible stories of torture and evil and massacres. And we must never forget them, he said. Never forget them. So it's not forgive and forget. You can't forget. But we can't let them take over our hearts and turn them cold and shrivel them up. It's harder one by our human power than throwing a mountain into the sea. But it's got to be there. Because there's no way forward without that. And when we find that and are able to do that, whatever it may be, and all of us, different people, different situations, whenever you stand praying, forgive. 
if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Because we're all sinners, every one of us. We're all in need of forgiveness. And if we stand in the high icy citadel of condemnation and condemn other people, we're locked in. We get locked. The very bottom of hell, Dante, is not fire, but ice. Ice. The heart can become filled with ice. And we can become secure against the problems of this world by building a shell around us with no room for forgiveness. And yet if we do that, we will be in a very small place. And God wants us more than that for us. So when we stand before the Lord, he says, forgive. And the Lord will forgive you as you forgive others. We got to think about that and live it. And when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village opposite you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied at the door out in the open street and they untied it. And those who stood there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments on it and he sat upon it. And many spread their garments on the road and others spread leafy branches which they had cut down from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went out to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he taught and said to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and brought, sought a way to destroy him. For they feared him, because all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they went out of the city. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand praying, forgive, if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also, who is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.